Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our 2020 Airbus annual press conference. Could I please ask the remaining photographers to take your seats um, towards the back? Thank you very much. So my name is Julie Kitcher. I'm the Executive Vice President, Communications and Corporate Affairs here at Airbus. Presenting the results to you today are our CEO, Guillaume Fauri, and Dominic Assam, our Chief Financial Officer. On behalf of Airbus, I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today at our event center in Toulouse, and of course, to all of those who've joined us on the webcast, welcome. So, what will the day look like? Well, first, um, a quick safety briefing for those of you here physically with us in Toulouse. The fire exits can be found um, at, the, at the sides of the building. I was going to say at the front, at the rear, uh, follow the lighting on the floor, but we don't have any lighting on the floor, so please make sure you familiarize yourselves with the, uh, with the fire exits at the side and follow the green lights. And please note, we have no practice drills, uh, so if you do hear a fire alarm, please leave the building in an orderly way. So on to our proceedings today. Guillaume will begin with a brief, of our, um, a brief overview of our 2019 business achievements and the results. Then Dominic, of course, will present the numbers in a lot more detail. And finally, Guillaume will look uh, towards the year ahead, 2020. After that, of course, we're keen to take as many of your questions as possible. Uh, to make the most of your time today. So therefore, our introductory remarks uh, will be relatively brief. Please recognize that the conference today will be conducted in English. Um, we will not have simultaneous translations. Um, after the press conference, you'll be invited to join us for lunch. And of course, you're very welcome to use our facilities here until around 3 p.m. Um, and the management team may take some time uh, with you afterwards. And of course, as always, our Airbus team here uh, are with you to assist you. Uh, so if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, and, and ask them. They're at your disposal. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please take a few minutes, familiarize yourselves with the safe harbor statement, which you can see on the screens now. Remember that all forward-looking statements, such as our guidance, are based on assumptions. And as conditions may, may change, so may our production, uh, projections. So I let you take a couple of minutes to read the statement. Now, 2019 was undoubtedly a very eventful year. Uh, we'd like to share some of those achievements with you, and we're going to warm up with a video. Thank you.
Well, I think looking at that video, it's safe to say, what a year. So with that, I hand over to Guillaume Foy, our CEO. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, nice video indeed, makes me speechless. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear media colleagues. Uh, good to see so many of you here with us today. I uh, really appreciate your presence. And uh, welcome to those uh, watching us on the web. I'm happy to be here today with uh, Dominique and Julie to take you through our 2019 performance and share elements of our roadmap for 2020. But beforehand, maybe a quick word on this morning's other announcement. Together with the government of Quebec and Bombardier, we have agreed a new ownership structure for the A220 program. Under this agreement, Airbus and the uh, Quebec government become the sole owners. This agreement demonstrates our strong support and commitment to the A220 and uh, Airbus in Canada. Furthermore, it extends our trustful partnership with the government of Quebec. This is uh, good news for our customers and employees, as well as for the aerospace industry in Quebec and in Canada. I'm sure you will have questions later on this, but now back to our results. As uh, Julie mentioned, 2019 has been an eventful year for Airbus. Uh, we've been faced with many challenges and uncertainties on a global scale, and despite this complex environment, we've managed to set foundations for the sustainable growth we want to deliver as a company in the coming years. I'd like to quickly address uh, some of the key topics for Airbus in 2019. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them already. In 2019, we made good progress despite industrial uh, challenges and a complex geopolitical environment. We delivered 863 aircraft last year, ramping up our production by approximately 8%. We demonstrated a strong underlying financial performance in 2019. We delivered an EBIT adjusted at 6.9 billion euros, an increase of 19% compared to the previous year. But we also faced some significant challenges throughout the year too. First, compliance. Last month, we reached final agreement with the French, UK, and US authorities resolving investigations into Airbus. We have agreed to pay penalties of 3.6 billion euros plus interest and costs. This is the price to pay to turn the page on those past practices and move forward. On the defense and space side, we are now in a position where we need to take new measures in order to restore the profitability of the division in the face of low order intake over recent years and a degradation of our financial performance. The restructuring program, which we intend to launch this year, will aim to address the division's cost structure. On the A400M, while we completed the rebase lining and made great progress on technical capabilities, we've had to revise our export assumptions and recognize an additional charge, notably also in the face of the continued German export ban on Saudi Arabia. Overall, the penalties from the agreements and this new charge on the F-400M have pushed our 2019 results into a net loss, and it will significantly impact our free cash flow in 2020. Of course, we cannot be satisfied with that. But resolving those complex topics has allowed us to gain more clarity on our future, and we are confident about sustaining our operational improvements in EBIT and cash generation in the coming years. Taking this into account, as well as the good prospects in 2020, the board of directors will propose a dividend of 1.8 euro per share, which is an increase of 9%. Our focus in 2020 will be on reinforcing our company culture, improving operationally and adjusting our cost structure to strengthen the financial performance and prepare for the future. So let me provide you with a quick overview of our 2019 achievements in the commercial aircraft area against the complex backdrop I have just described. Overall, we've seen a robust commercial environment last year and strong demand for our products, with passenger traffic growing more than 4% and load factors above 80% on average. In that environment, and we had another strong year for Airbus commercial aircraft deliveries in 2019, 863 aircraft shipped to customers worldwide, 8% increase 
compared with 2018. I want to sincerely thank our Airbus employees around the world for this incredible team achievement. Thanks to collective efforts, um, we have set yet another impressive performance. On the booking side, we logged 768 net orders in 2019 compared to 747 in 2018. And we reached a historic milestone last year by taking Airbus overall cumulative net orders above the 20,000 mark. Our backlog has stabilized close to the 7,500 mark, and we saw the value of our backlog increase by 12 billion euros uh, compared to previous year. Before we move on to helicopters, I'd like to uh, share a short update on WTO, World Trade Organization. In October last year, in October 19, the US levied a 10% tariff on Airbus aircraft imported from the EU into the US. This had a direct impact on our commercial aircraft customers in the US, which we are working to manage. Later this year, the WTO is expected to authorize the EU to impose tariffs on US products. We remain hopeful that the US and the EU will find a negotiated settlement to avoid further damage. Now on to helicopters. For the third year in a row, Airbus Helicopters has achieved a net book to bill by value above one and maintained its leadership in the civil and parapublic market. This is a very significant achievement in the current uh, market context and a testimony to the success of the team to make the division resilient and competitive in the face of a continued civil market downturn. But in defense, we continue to see good prospects. In total, we booked 310 uh, net orders in 2019, including 25 for the Super Puma family and 23 NH90s, as well as 10 orders for the H160, which will enter into service this year. The share of services in our 2019 order intake also increased compared to last year, which further contributes to the resilience of the division. Now, let's take a look at the Airbus defense and space activity. While we continue to see significant opportunities in the long term for defense and space business. We faced a challenging environment last year with a book to build below one. Our order intake for 2019 was supported mainly by F400M service contracts and key contracts in space. Several key milestones were reached in 2019 in, in accordance with a revised, revised capability roadmap for the F400M. We also held our commitment to deliver 14 A400M last year in line with the latest delivery schedule. We completed the uh, rebaselining of the program and made progress on the technical capabilities. However, we are facing significant headwinds on exports, also because of the extended German export ban to Saudi Arabia. This has led us to reassess our export assumptions and recognize a charge of 1.2 billion euro. In the military aircraft domain, contract negotiations on major campaigns, for instance for Eurofighter and Eurodrone, are currently underway. Although the exact timing of contract award is difficult to predict, this gives us confidence in the long term. We are also very happy with the decision taken yesterday by the Bundestag to approve the launch of the first demonstrator phase for the future combat air system. This is a very important milestone for this key European project in which we intend to play a critical role in the decades to come. Thank you, Guillaume. So Dominic, welcome. We're really happy to have you here with us. Uh, can we take a look at the financial performance uh, and the year 2019 from your perspective? Sure, Julie. Firstly, it's a pleasure to be here at my first uh, Airbus annual press conference and I hope to meet many of you here today. I think it's fair to say that we achieved a lot in 2019 with record commercial aircraft deliveries, but even more importantly, a strong underlying financial performance. This allowed us to deliver on our guidance to the financial markets, despite the many challenges we had to face last year. Starting with the top line, 
In 2019, we generated revenues of 70.5 billion euros, an 11% increase compared with 2018. This was mainly driven by the higher level of deliveries and a favorable product mix. Looking at our underlying profitability or EBIT adjusted, we delivered 6.9 billion euros. This was a 19% increase year on year. As a reminder, we guided for a 15% annual rise. So how did we achieve this? This was largely driven by the A320 ramp up and the new premium, as well, as well as good progress on the A350. At helicopters, this was supported by an increased contribution from services and lower R&D costs. If you look at the reported consolidated EBIT, this was around 1.3 billion euros and included net negative adjustments totaling about 5.6 million euros. These included notably a 3.6 billion charge related to the penalties from the French, UK and US authorities following the compliance investigations, as well as 1.2 billion charge mainly related to the revision of the export potential at completion for the A400M. Because of these negative adjustments, we reported a net loss for the year. We are obviously not satisfied with this exceptionally high level of adjustments, and it will be our priority to manage it down. We believe a lot is behind us, but we still have work to do in 2020. For instance, in terms of managing the consequences of our compliance settlement, but also restructuring some of our businesses. In defense and space, we started discussions with our social partners in December last year. We target a, a restructuring program to address the cost structure and restore an adequate level of profitability of the division. Meanwhile, Premium Aerotech has started preparing a restructuring program for which we have provided a 103 million charge in our 2019 accounts. In terms of cash, our free cash flow before M&A and customer financing stood at about 3.5 billion euros, an increase of 21% year on year. This reflects our record deliveries and strong operating earnings performance. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And I'm sure uh, there'll be questions in more detail a little bit later. So now, uh, Guillaume, back to you, please, uh, with a forward look at 2020 and a look at the group priorities for the year. Thank you, Julie. So as I said earlier, we achieved a lot in 2019. So let's look at what we have set ourselves as a target for 2020. Let me read it again for you. As a basis for our 2020 guidance, we assume that the world economy and air traffic will grow in line with prevailing independent forecasts, which assume no major disruptions, including from the coronavirus. The current tariff regime will uh, remain a change. So the 2020 earnings and free cash flow guidance is before m &A. We target around 880 commercial aircraft deliveries in 2020. On that basis, we expect to deliver an EBIT adjusted of approximately 7.5 billion euros and free cash flow before m and and customer financing of approximately 4 billion euros before the penalty payments and the consumption of the compliance-related provisions for tax and legal disputes. So to wrap up, uh, we've put a lot behind us in 2019 and are now looking at 2020 to set the foundations of sustainable growth. What do I mean by sustainable growth? We want to achieve a smoother delivery flow for single aisle production system, focusing on quality and safety and meeting our commitments towards our customers. This will be achieved through a more streamlined delivery profile. This focus on sustainable growth applies to the commercial aircraft perimeter, but also to our helicopters and defense and space businesses where we'll further work to strengthen our resilience and our competitiveness in challenging market environments. We will also work to adjust our cost structure to strengthen the financial performance and prepare for the future. And with this, uh, back to you, Julie. Thanks, Guillaume. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as promised, it was a, a short, uh, in, uh, short introduction. Uh, we'd like to begin our Q&A session now. Um, just a few housekeeping rules, please, if I may. Uh, when asking a question, 
please state your organization, um, the, the organization that you represent and your name. Um, and please bear in mind, we have quite a large number of people following us online. So uh, if you'd be kind enough, if you're able to, to stand, uh, that would be appreciated. Um, of course, please wait for one of our colleagues to come with a microphone um, and try and express your question as clearly as possible to ensure that we can understand the question uh, as well as your, your colleagues in the room. And please, uh, finally, if you can ask your question in English, that would be much appreciated. Otherwise, uh, we'll have somebody translate the question to us um, as necessary, but the answer will be provided in English. So thank you. Uh, let's start with the questions. Thomas. Oops, thank you. Thomas Anke from Handelsblatt. Uh, two questions, if I may. First, on uh, tariffs. Uh, the day after tomorrow, I think the US government has to explain uh, the way in which they want to go forward. Do you expect that will affect you? Could they raise the tariffs charged on, on Airbus uh, planes or, or parts? And how will it develop on the, in the longer run after the, the next WTO uh, ruling? And the second question on the charge you are taking, the three-digit million charge, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled. What is it exactly for? You mentioned tax disputes. You mentioned the, the uh, upcoming cost on the management of the uh, settlement and, and also more legal uh, disputes. What, what is it exactly for? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Dominique, I suggest I take the first one and sure. hand over the, to you for the second one. Well, on the tariffs, uh, we, we don't know. <laughs> we are like uh, anybody else and, and waiting for their decisions to uh, potentially modify the goods on which they will apply tariffs and uh, uh, the percentage of tariffs they apply on those goods. Um, we'll observe and uh, we'll manage that situation. Basically, what is important for us is the next steps, uh, are the next steps, and especially the next WTO decision um, that will potentially give to the EU the right to apply tariffs on US goods coming into Europe. We think it's important, it's an important milestone, because that's the moment where there will be some rebalancing, and depending from the, the time difference uh, of the two, um, uh, the two claims to the WTO, and therefore this is the moment where we believe, we have hope that uh, time for resolution will come, and uh, things will move forward. Um, the charge? Sure. So on the charge, uh, first of all, when you talk about tax, uh, it's simply the fact that, you know, the payments uh, to some of the parties involved in these um, cases which were described in these settlements are not tax deductible and they have been deducted from tax, so we now have to regularize that. And then there was a whole list of other claims from all kinds of parties in the context of compliance and monitoring costs, but please uh, understand we cannot go into details here that would potentially cause prejudice to the company, so we keep out of that. Thank you, Dominic. So next question, please. We've been. Uh, hi, good morning, uh, Ben Katz from the Wall Street Journal. Um, three, but I'll try to be very quick. Uh, the first is um, obviously, you know, I guess congratulations on the A220 taking over, you know, a much bigger stake. Um, one of the things that came up when Bombardier announced that they would be reviewing it is that they said that the expectations for when you would reach break even had been pushed back um, and that the financial assumptions had changed. Uh, maybe you can tell us, I, I'm not sure if you can, uh, about the specifics of that, uh, when you now expect that program to break even. Um, and secondly, what was it that motivated that the change in the financials? Um, the second thing, a short one, is just on the A350s, you've guided towards nine to 10 a, a, a month this year um, in terms of rates. I'm just curious whether um, that's connected at all to you know, the slowdown in wide body uh, demand. Uh, maybe you can just address you know, wide body demand in general. Um, and then the last one just on coronavirus is um, you know, a lot of focus is on the Chinese airlines. Um, have you been approached in terms of financing uh, to assist with any of these, uh, any of your customers? Um, and secondly, the, you know, the focus is really on China, but also there's a lot of concern about the entire region um, and whether there's any concern that some airlines outside of China uh, might be impacted or might even go bust as a result of this. Thanks. Dominic, I propose to hand over to you for the A220, and I take the, the 350 and the coronavirus. 
Yeah. So on the A220, um, you've seen that we have delivered 48 aircraft last year. If you look at the rate potential we have in the both uh, final assembly lines in Mobile USA and in Mirabel Canada, um, they can do 10 and 4 rate per month respectively. So if you gross that up to a year, you talk about 160, 170 aircraft. And we need to come to a decent fill rate in both of these final assembly lines to make it break even, which we currently foresee to happen in the middle of this decade. So we are ramping up the program and investing in that program that we believe in. On the A350, um, yes, we guided, uh, we reached the right 10 in 2019. We guided between rate 9 and 10. So that's rather stability on the A350, and we had a very good year in terms of booking. So we think the 350 itself is performing very well. But in a market that has been more demanding for white bodies, I commented last year already on the fact that I thought there was oversupply. We've seen our competitor um, revising its own um, uh, rates uh, moving forward. So I think uh, we, we're okay with uh, this uh, rate 9 to 10 on the 350 and what we've said on the 330 moving forward uh, in the current context. Okay, And I say this because uh, of your next question, which is the coronavirus. Uh, it's, we're at the beginning of the crisis. Um, it's developing up, down, improving. We don't know yet. Uh, what is very important maybe to share here is that um, after the week in China um, of closing because of the uh, Chinese New Year, uh, the government asked for an additional week of, uh, of closure, which we did. We followed the recommendation of the government and the World Health Organization recommendations as well. Uh, and um, now this week, uh, the plants have opened again. And, and therefore, we see a new phase moving forward with a lot of precautions on health and safety and, and uh, the outbreak itself. But um, the industry is starting to work again, and we're very much monitoring that uh, part of the, of the situation. There's obviously another one, which is uh, with the airlines themselves. The traffic in China or from and to China has been very weak for two weeks. Um, I don't know what are the figures, by the way, for, for this uh, week, actually. And for the moment, what we have heard is uh, mainly, if not solely, from Chinese airlines and short-term measures that they were taking in front of that situation. I have no, uh, no indication on what it could mean for uh, other airlines in the broader region at that stage. Now we have Christian that is uh, in Singapore this week, so we might know more uh, beginning of next week when he'll be back. Thank you. So we have one in the, in the middle here at the front. No. <laughs> for the Allgemeine. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, but first, the first question would be on the uh, compliance issue. Um, is uh, Airbus uh, considering as a company going against uh, ex-employees? I think that is uh, also a question that would be uh, interesting for shareholders. The second question would be on the A400M. It seems like a never-ending uh, story. Uh, when do you see uh, light at the end of the tunnel? Um, I understood from your presentation to the analysts uh, that there will be a cash uh, train a drain till the mid uh, 2020s, if I understood correctly. So, so, so when is is this flow of negative news uh, finally over? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, the resolution on the compliance side is uh, is an Airbus resolution uh, with the with the authorities. Um, it was and it is it was their investigation and um, uh, they, they are in charge to decide what they want to do with individuals. We are not. Um, on the, um, on the F400M, well, uh, we've done a lot of uh, positive improvements and we reached a lot of key milestones on the F400M program uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the nations with whom we have, uh, we have contracts. So the rebaselining was very important. We managed to uh, reached key milestones on major capabilities last year, and uh, we are moving forward positively with the execution of those contracts. What we are addressing this year is uh, the, the prospect for export in the time frame of the main contracts, and we have revised our uh, views on the number of planes that would fall into this, uh, this time frame, um, given what we see on the market and uh, having a year more of experience plus the situation 
and, and the ban on exports, which obviously has an impact as this region of the world is a very important region for us when it comes to export. So I think um, I would be more positive on the f It's really a program that is moving forward. Yes, the uh, export charge we're taking this year is, uh, is significant, uh, but we continue to further de-risk the program moving forward. Thank you. We have one here. Brief. Good morning, uh, Mirko Reibka, Plato Brief. I have two questions, please. Um, the first question is uh, how long and in what extent would you expect to uh, benefit from the problems at Boeing Company? And the second question, um, with respect to the German export restrictions, um, do you plan any consequences um, maybe for future projects uh, in space and defense? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> it might look like a paradox, but on the short term, we don't benefit from the uh, situation with a competitor. Uh, and on top, it has to do with safety, and safety is paramount for the industry. This is one of the things we really have, we all have in common. For reasons I'm sure you know, we cannot take benefit on the 320. We are sold out till 2025, roughly, and uh, therefore we cannot step in um, to, to offset the needs of some airlines, customers that would not be fulfilled by uh, the situation of the grounding uh, of the MAX. So that's what I can say at that stage. Um, and uh, restrictions on export, well, yes, it's indeed a problem, um, not only for the F400M, but uh, for export to that region. It creates uncertainty and, and complexity. The export market is bigger than, than this region, but it's, uh, it's a topic on which we are kindly and respectfully asking for clarity moving forward. And you know that for us, exports are very important and uh, are part of the equation of military programs. So that's obviously something we would expect clarification. We understand positive progress has been made in the um, relationship between France and Germany and the uh, uh, Hachen agreement. Um, more color is expected, but obviously for large programs moving forward, uh, we expect a better situation. Thank you. Thank you. There's one at the front, please. Good morning, Sebastian Steinke from Flugrevue in Germany. I have a question to, concerning your US competitor as well, please. He might be tempted to come up with the next single aisle program earlier than expected. And I wonder, will this affect the Airbus single aisle strategy in any way? Like you, do you expect to have a long running program like you do now? Or do you need to come up with your own new single eye program maybe one day earlier as expected. And as we are standing next to the final assembly line of the A380, which is expecting the final pair of wings for a final assembly, I would like to ask you, is this the end of very big aircraft we are facing today, or is Airbus thinking about one big program in the future, maybe far out, but is this something possible in the future as well? Thank you. Well, I always like questions on, on products, so thank you very much. Um, the single aisle question is a very important one. Um, the A320 family is sort of 75% of uh, the deliveries of Airbus. And as there, are, there is a small number of competitors in the market, we are all looking at each other. This being said, uh, we have a very successful A320 uh, product line that is in maturity. It's not uh, by far not end of life. We continue to introduce new variants and, and to ramp up the production. Uh, the XLR that was launched earlier this year is extremely successful. Um, and we continue to see a lot of demand for the product. Um, what will happen, um, we don't know. Um, what I can tell you is, I would not like to be in a situation to have to launch a new single aisle now, because we've just introduced into service a new generation of engines, and would you go to a future single aisle, you would need to do a breakthrough on the uh, propulsion side, and this is not available, this is not available for anybody now. Um, we see, I, I think for Airbus, the next 
plane will be a digital native. We see digital in many, many dimensions becoming very important for aviation and therefore some of those technologies are not prepared either. And we would need to do a major breakthrough as well on, on CO2 and emissions. And therefore I think for no one in the industry those technologies are ready today. And therefore I think uh, there, is be, there will be a bit more time before we have clarity on what and when the next generation of single aisle hits the market. That's what I can say for as far as Airbus is concerned, uh, might give an indication of what we think uh, of what might happen on the other side. On the A380, uh, well, one of the reasons why we had end of production is the incredible success of the new large twins uh, in terms of fuel efficiency, in terms of range, in terms of cost efficiency, in terms of carbon footprint compared to uh, the previous very large uh, four engine planes. And I don't see in the short term mid-term, any reason to consider there is a room again for very large aircraft. Now, things can change over time, but as far as I can see today, I think the future is with the success of the large twins, and especially the 350 and the 350-1000 when it's about carrying a large number of people on long distances, but more point to point. Thank you, Guillaume. So we have one over here, and then we take her. Good morning, Charlotte Ryan from Bloomberg News. Um, my first question is on Brexit, sorry to say. I know we've had a little bit more confidence from companies uh, now that we are officially leaving, we have a transition, but it does look like there are gonna be customs delays even with the deal. So just wondering what your thoughts are on how Airbus's operations will be affected at the beginning of 2021 under Brexit. And secondly, we've had a lot of talk recently about flight shaming. How do you see Airbus's role as the industry looks to address some of the environmental challenges? Thank you. Um, Brexit first. Uh, there still is some uncertainty on Brexit. The new deadline in front of us is uh, end of 2020. You, you rightly pointed out to this point. And we see that there is still risks of uh, disruptions and even potentially uh, a risk of uh, no deal Brexit. It is for us a much smaller risk compared to what it was uh, previously as we've been preparing for a potential no deal Brexit three times in a row in 2019. Uh, what we think is really important moving forward on the Brexit is the long-term relationship between the EU and the UK as we are an aviation ecosystem that needs um, a very efficient uh, trade system um, across the uh, British Channel. So uh, that's where we put the majority of our attention now. When it comes to uh, flight shaming, uh, what's the role of Airbus? Well, I think uh, manifold and trying to be short, uh, one role is to put things in perspective and to which extent uh, aviation has reduced its uh, carbon footprint per plane with the efficiency and the reduction of 80% of the carbon footprint per passenger and kilometer uh, over the last decades through technology and, um, and improvement of the planes themselves. And we want to carry this forward so, and put things in perspective. Aviation, um, in spite of its huge success and the billions of people being transported every year, uh, being only 2.5% of carbon emissions. Well, I say 2.5 only. We think uh, we have to work to reduce this one and to uh, decarbonize aviation. And that's the second part of my answer. At Airbus, we are fully convinced that global warming is a reality. And we want to take this very serious, being the ones driving the industry in decarbonizing the planes. We have uh, research, technologies, innovation, and these are part of the, the steps, uh, the major steps we will take for the next generation of planes to make sure we are decarbonizing the industry. And we want to run this, we want to be supported, uh, we want this to be visible, because we truly believe in the social um, uh, um, help and the, the social dimension of aviation uniting and connecting people around the world. And we might forget that this is very important for peace, stability, understanding uh, other cultures and having the human beings living together on this planet. And we think aviation plays a role, so we want to be sustainable as an aviation business.
Good morning. This is uh, Iñaki de las Heras from Expansion. Um, I've got two questions, one of them about the division of uh, space and defense, and the other one about uh, Boeing. The first one, um, you, you are preparing a, cost, a strong cost reduction in this uh, division, in space, and defense, space and defense, defense and space. Uh, what will be the, the effect over the labor force and in Spain and Spain is a country that is very exposed no, to this activity so uh, is there any figure about the labor force uh, reduction in Spain and, and the second question you have said um, Airbus is not taking advantage advantages in the Boeing crisis Anyway, um, you've got uh, just 21 new orders, which is not a, not a, a strong progression, but the value of these orders, it has improved in uh, 46%. So um, it seems to be a strong growth in margins. And this growth in margins is not related to the, to the crisis of, your, of, of Boeing. You, you, you are not in the commercial area making a strong progress thanks to this crisis? Thank you. So I start with the um, defense and space situation. Um, to have a future, we need to be competitive. Um, we need to be able to invest, and especially in those businesses which are driven by technology and uh, industrial dimensions, um, that's very important. We've seen a weak level of orders um, in the past three years. The space business is um, very challenged. We are not the only ones. We've seen others uh, suffering from that situation. So we want to drive the competitiveness by reducing the cost base and being able to, uh, to grow and, and to invest for the future. That's why we're doing this. Uh, obviously, there is a social dimension when there is a restructuring, and there will be one. Uh, at Airbus, this is always something we discuss first with employees and their representatives, and, and we are very attached to that. We've run a couple of restructuring in the past years, and I had to run two waves of restructuring in helicopters because of the oil and gas crisis, and we did it in a very respectful and rather positive way with our employees, and this is the way we intend to do it. You're right to, to mention Spain, as 70% of the Airbus activity in Spain is in uh, defense and space, which has been very positive over the last decade with the growth and, and the development of major programs in this field. Um, and this is something we will be particularly uh, cautious with in a situation where this is the defense and space business that uh, will be impacted by the restructuring. The question on the backlog, uh, this is the way I understood it, and, and the Boeing is maybe a bit more technical, maybe too technical for me, uh, Dominic, should I look at you? <laughs> I don't think so, but I still do it. Um, so on the, on the question whether we benefit on the margin side from Boeing, I can really say no, because if you think about when the backlog we are currently executing for 2020, 2021 has been locked in for the single aisle program, that was way before the grounding of the 737, so the prices for that time frame are fixed. And um, from that perspective, um, it's really so-called self-help margin expansion by improving uh, the mix towards ACF, A321, and working on the productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. It's just here. No. <laughs> Thank you. Gianni Dragoni from Italy, Il Sole, 24 Ore. Uh, I have some questions. Um, about uh, <clears throat> the compliance agreement, uh, I, I would like to have a clarification. You, you took the charges in uh, 2019, but you will, have, you will pay later, so the financial effect is not still reflected. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Is the first yeah, question. I mean, the, and, um, well. I, okay. Well, I would like to, yeah. They almost. Um, and then uh, about the net financial position of Airbus, I, I read in the press release the net cash posi position, but is that also the net financial, including debts or not? And uh, about uh, ATR, the joint venture with Leonardo, could you give some information about uh, the results and the financial performance of ATR? And lastly, the new, um, the new um, fighter, European fighter, we've seen the press release, but uh, is there any, any progress uh, 
uh, regard to the other project, the UK Tempest, or not? I mean, talks to, to okay. have only one aircraft. Okay. So, so I'll start with the finan financial questions. Um, the fine will be paid pretty much as we speak. So by the end of this quarter, the 3.6 billion will have been paid. And then um, there's topics like tax regularization, which we discussed about, which will gradually flow out over the coming years. In terms of net financial position, yes, our net cash means the kind of liquidity and securities we have on the asset side of the balance sheet minus the financial liability. So yes, the debt is deducted. Uh, ATR is a joint venture, and I like very much that plane, but I will let uh, ATR communicate on, on their results. They, they did a quite of a very strong uh, year-end rally uh, in terms of deliveries. Um, uh, the FCAS uh, is moving forward. It's a major program for, for Europe. We are very happy that this is the case. Um, this uh, phase 1A, the demonstrator phase, is a very important one where the commitment of Germany and France behind that program starts to, to be real, I mean with the real money, and we think this is very important. I don't want to comment uh, on the Tempest. Uh, we are not on board the Tempest. We are on board the FCAS, and I let the uh, partners of Tempest comment and answer your questions on that program. Thank you. Hi, Lawrence Frost, Reuters. Um, first of all, two questions, if I may. Uh, could you give us an update on the status of the Tianjin plant uh, in terms of production and when you expect to get back to um, six planes a month output? And then regarding the bribery settlement, it has spawned a series of investigations elsewhere in the world, some drawing in serving executives and officials, what are you doing to mitigate the fallout that that will have for ongoing commercial relationships? Uh, thank you, Laurence. Uh, hello again, good to see you. Um, the change in plant, uh, the situation is, is quite simple actually. As we have restarted production uh, this week, earlier this week, um, in, in more complex uh, health and safety environments, but with the same organization and uh, the same efficiency, well, basically, it's a, it's a week of production which has been lost, and we will try to recover uh, within the year. Uh, and that's what we would expect from the management of the coronavirus situation uh, in China. So that's the situation as of today. And again, as I said earlier, we, we want to very carefully manage and, and monitor the situation moving forward. Um, on the um, compliance case, well, um, I mean, putting behind us uh, this and having the DPA and the CGIP in France for the very vast majority of our relationships with customers and with governments, it's very much helping. Uh, because, and as you have seen, uh, explained by the authorities, uh, we have cooperated. Uh, we have now a very structured and solid compliance system. And for us as a company, it's very important uh, to show that face and to make sure that uh, what was inappropriate uh, is behind us. So um, that's basically the situation. There are a few cases that indeed need to be mitigated and it's case by case, it's one by one. And there are not that many actually. Thank you. Hi, Miguel Elizondo from El Español, Spanish Diary. Uh, last year, a Spanish government took the decision to choose INRA for coordinate the FCAS program in Spain. Uh, this was a, a very highly criticized decision. Um, my question is, are you working in trying to change this decision and how do you see uh, Airbus uh, rule in, in, in Spain for FCAS program in the future? Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a very clear question and I will give you a clear answer. Uh, we think um, it's a mistake to uh, select Indra as the Spanish coordinator for the FCAS program. The FCAS is about developing the next generation of uh, air and space power systems, which means 
connecting satellites, fighters, and developing a new fighter, uh, tankers, helicopters, drones, uh, remote carriers. And these are really the kind of systems we know, we develop, and, and I think this is the role we have to play in the FCAS in Europe for the success of FCAS. This is something we have shared with the uh, Spanish government and we have offered. Our, uh, our hands to reverse the situation and make sure uh, the best support is given from Spain to the FCAS and that um, Spain is getting the best from the FCAS. So we think this should be reversed, but it's not our decision. Uh, we just make our points and explain why we think this needs to be changed. It's uh, again uh, something which is outstanding for the moment, but I think there is a better and better understanding why it would make sense to have Airbus in that role, in the leading role. Thierry Dubois, Aviation Week, three questions on the single aisle family. Could you put numbers on the delivery delays for the A320neo family? And then could you explain what a more streamlined delivery profile means? And finally, are you seeing supply chain issues uh, as a result of the max grounding? Thank you, Thierry. Um so on the A320 uh, delays, well, basically, we, we, the delays uh, were created in the transition from CO to NEO and all the engine issues we had in 2018, 2017, 2018. Um, and we've not been able to recover, as of today, uh, what has been um, lost in the past in terms of uh, uh, speed of ramp up and, and timing of ramp up. So we run... Uh, more or less with six months delays on the NEO family uh, today. And this is our objective, to recover these six months of delays in the course of the next year or two, or let's say 18 months. Uh, how do we streamline? Um, well, it's, uh, it's a mix of uh, many different measures, but basically uh, w one of the reasons why we we are not able to catch up enough in 2019 was the increase of the share of the 321 and especially the ramp up of the Airbus Cabin Flex version, which has been very su commercially successful. <laughs> and that uh, led to a lot of head of versions and, um, and growth in 2019. This has been digested. You remember that I was quite careful on this uh, when we met uh, after the uh, half year result of 2019. Well, a lot uh, positive has been achieved and we start 2020 in a much better position. Uh, one of the um, uh, ways to streamline is to what I call de-bottleneck Hamburg, which is today the sole site with all the 321s. And given the huge commercial success of the 321, not even mentioning the XLR, uh, we need to give more capacity uh, to the production system outside of Hamburg. This is what we are doing uh, with the uh, assembly line that will be uh, set up in Toulouse, that will be a 320 slash 321 assembly line, and we'll be able to better share. But we have taken as well a lot of measures which are linked to our standards, process, procedures, processes, ways of working in Hamburg, and this has made a lot of progress um, which we could see in the last quarter, and especially uh, uh, with, the, with the delivery flow of the SEF. Uh, supply chain, uh, well, th th there was a, our competitor decided to maintain the production rates um, in 2019 and finally um, changed the, uh, the decision, reversed the decision to finally stop production uh, beginning of 2020. This is quite of a shock wave in, the, uh, in their own uh, supply chain and some of the suppliers are common suppliers. And therefore, we are monitoring very carefully the situation of our suppliers, their situation moving forward. Obviously, they have a significant Airbus business for those suppliers, and they are probably less exposed than others. But we want to make sure in this period of ramp up of the single aisle that those suppliers um, uh, keep going and, and can continue to support us. I have no alert as we speak today, but this is a situation we will be monitoring over time. It's not the first time. Uh, in fact, we do it all the time. We are monitoring uh, the supply chain, working with our suppliers um, 
at, at any moment, but this is, with coronavirus, probably the two main areas of uh, attention that we need to have on the supply chain as we speak. Thank you. David? Uh, David Kaminsky from Flight Global. Um, how confident are you about your ability to win business in parts of the world where, quote, bad practices of the past are still seen, rightly or wrongly, as a normal part of doing business? And how does an organization your size, selling high-value assets to those parts of the world, manage to keep itself on track and avoid slipping back into those bad practices uh, unintentionally or otherwise? Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a very important question for Airbus. Um, the first part of my answer is uh, we think uh, and, and we see, we observe that a company like Airbus um, benefits from having a strong compliance system, for, uh, from doing everything we can uh, to avoid and, and be um, out of any um, illegal practices. We've seen in the recent years a strong um, order book a strong commercial success at a time where we, will, we were heavily working to put this system in place and we are extremely careful um, to, to um, uh, yes, refrain from any illegal and, and inappropriate um, act of this very nature. But basically what I'm suggesting here is um, we will continue to um, work on our compliance system. We will continue to make sure we are extremely um, 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 I mean, visible as a company uh, which uh, is working uh, with compliance, with rules and regulations, and with no uh, bribery and corrupt practices in the future. That's extremely important for me as a CEO and for the board. Um, you, you, you're never there. You always need to work and improve and be very cautious, and that's the commitment um, uh, we're having. So um, that's the situation. Now, um, we want this to be the norm, and I observe that there are, in fact, many, many regions of the world where the majority of players want to go in that direction. The world is really changing, and is changing in that direction, and that's why we are really happy to be uh, putting this behind us, because we put it very high on our agendas. And when I speak about the four pillars uh, for sustainability of Airbus, I put compliance in the pillars as I put safety, quality and integrity. It shows the level of commitment we have inside the company to what we call compliance. We think it helps for the business, not the opposite. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Stefan Weyer of DPA AFX. Uh, just a question uh, concerning Boeing uh, again and uh, your production rates. <clears throat> uh, are you still thinking about for a longer term, uh, term fr uh, time frame uh, to ramping up production uh, to rate 70, what, which was discussed, uh, I think, uh, already uh, three years ago. Is this st uh, still a possible goal or can we forget it and you just say uh, we have this uh, 63 rate on the A320 and uh, this uh, will be for the foreseeable uh, time uh, the goal you are um, uh, able to fulfill. And uh, are you uh, talking to Boeing customers who are now in the cr deep crisis of your competitor, uh, think about uh, switching to Airbus and uh, what can you tell them uh, other than to say uh, wait six or seven years for your first plane? Um, starting with the rates, um, so we move towards rate 63 for 2021 and we have indicated this morning that we will keep increasing by one or two points of rate per year in 2022 and 2023. 
which basically means, if we translate it into 2023 terms, that we think that we will be between 65 and 67 by end of 2023. So we are coming not that far from the rate 70 that was a figure we saw in the press in 2018 when we asked to the supply chain to position themselves up to rate 70. And you remember that in 2018, we had a lot of pushback for the rate 70. So we take this approach, which is part of the sustainability or the sustainable trajectory that um, we were mentioning before. Now, speaking to, uh, to airlines, I mean, we continuously and constantly speak to all airlines, um, especially our own customers. Uh, we want to stay very loyal to our customers and we put priority to those who have already uh, ordered our planes. And because of the situation of the, uh, the backlog of the A320, it's indeed very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to propose slots in the time frame that would fit uh, to be able to, uh, to compensate for the uh, shortfall of the production of the other product. So that's unfortunately the situation. Now we have opportunities on the 220 obviously, but it's a slightly uh, lower segment. But we think the 220 uh, can be a very, very appropriate solution for some of the needs in the market. We see the success of the product growing, and we think uh, the 220 is a very, very strong offer for many customers. Um, good morning. Um, let me insist a little bit on the defense and space uh, business. Uh, Carlos Friza from, from El Confidencial. Um, I would like to know um, regarding the provision um, from 1.2 billion, is this is related mainly with the free seat campaign in Saudi Arabia? Um, or that includes uh, several campaigns that you think you are not able to, 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 to close in the, in the uh, coming years? Second, um, regarding the total cost of the A400M program, um, it is above 30,000 uh, billion euros now, and you have 174 orders. So how many more orders do you need at least to make this program, uh, to, to take this program to a break-even point? And last one, and, and personal doubt is, the, regarding the compliance issues. And you have been negotiating these issues um, for several years, um, but Airbus did not make any provision in those years. So why didn't you make any provision uh, before uh, 2019? Thank you. Yeah. So on the A400M, um, this is not a campaign-specific provision we've taken. We've looked basically at the initial contract with the so-called Oka Nations and looked at how much cost was planned to be absorbed in export campaigns in total. And we have significantly haircut that number. And I don't want to go into the details as to how many are there left, but what I can say is that the haircut we took in terms of number in that provision is significantly larger than what's still left in the calculation. So we have made significant progress towards de-risking. Um, in terms of the um, provision um, on the compliance, you want to take that or should I? OK. Um, I was not quite sure where exactly you were driving there. The why, why no provision? Uh, so why, why no provision? Yeah, I mean, uh, the answer is quite straightforward. It was impossible to quantify earlier, because we had basically um, different campaigns that were analyzed over different time frames where it was unclear for which time frame it's relevant. There was not clear what discounts or, or adders would be imposed by the authorities. So if you compound all these factors, it was such a kind of wide range that it would have been completely misleading uh, to mention any number. And this is why we only put the provision in the books as we had some idea as to how much that would be ultimately paid. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, hi, Anne Bauer from the newspaper Les Echo. Uh, on a broader view, Mr. Furry, could you explain us uh, how do you explain such poor performance in defense and space at a time where all the states are 
increasing the spending in defense and where space is more or less a booming industry and just had lots of new commitments made by the different European states. And can you elaborate if uh, in defendant space, Airbus is truly an integrated group, or is it suffering distortion within Germany and France? Thank you, Anne. Um, first, I'd like to say that defense and space business is very important for Airbus. It's very important for me. I strongly believe in, in that business and the consistency of having it uh, within the scope of business of, um, of Airbus. That's also why uh, we take the, the, the high road and uh, we decide to restructure to make it competitive on the long term and to be able to benefit from those investments that you uh, mentioned before and the uh, forward-looking increase in, in spent uh, for uh, European countries in defense. But we are at the end of a very long decrease, as a matter of fact, on, um, on defense budgets. Well, we see as well that there is, um, in spite of a lot of new programs uh, popping up, uh, a rather low level of um, bookings uh, in the industry, and that led to the 8.5 billion euros booking uh, last year, that is a book to bid of 0.8. Um, and it's also driven by space. If in space, uh, I mean, we see the new space coming, uh, we see the need for a lot of investments, and we are as well investing, as you know, in space on small satellites, on the new technologies for um, Earth observation and, and telecoms. Uh, this is putting pressure on the, um, on the profitability. So that's why um, we decided to uh, take the situation uh, head on, um, look into the future, uh, and do the right things to be able to be competitive and, and benefit from uh, those European programs. And this leads me to the second question. Well, actually, we are the only um, integrated company in Europe when it comes to defense and space. Um, and we think this is an asset for large programs uh, like uh, the Eurodrone or the Future Combat Air System moving forward. Uh, but obviously, those programs are in their infancy and uh, we will see the benefits of this capability to do business as an integrated company, as we are doing on the commercial side, uh, moving forward and moving ahead. So that's preparation of the future. Thank you. You are now a German news agency, uh, DPA. I also have a question on US tariffs and especially uh, on French uh, winemakers, wine growers, because they uh, have been hit very hard by that, um, by the tariffs imposed uh, in October. And uh, early this, this week, they were like, um, and they're not really happy about it. And early this week, they were asking for help. They are asking um, the French government, but also Airbus, um, for compensation. And if I'm not mistaken, there's going to be a meeting tomorrow. So um, I'm wondering what's your reaction to that complaints? Yeah, well, my first reaction is I feel a lot of solidarity with that situation because all the European products which are impacted by tariffs really suffer from that situation. And, and we are uh, one of them. Now, Going against Airbus, I think this is not the understanding of the situation we are in and this uh, block against block relationship. Uh, and the reality of the nature of the claim at WTO is such that I think that is not the right, the right way forward. The right way forward is to work together in these uh, different uh, filières, in these different businesses, uh, to make sure that the uh, European governments that are impacted in Europe uh, will step up and, um, and react against uh, the tariffs that have been put in place by the US against European products by putting tariffs on US products uh, going to Europe when uh, the uh, EU will be entitled to do that. And we are in that situation because the two cases, I mean, Boeing, Airbus, Europe, US, uh, were not in the same timing. The, the US was the first one to attack and the EU responded uh, eight or nine months later uh, back in uh, 2004, as far as I remember, uh, and that's the situation we're in. So I would more advocate for solidarity. We had the opportunity to meet a number of people from those businesses to explain and share. I understand their deep frustration uh, to be taken hostage of a, of a bigger thing, uh, and uh, we try to help as much as we can, but we are not against each other in that situation, in my view, at least. Uh, good, good morning, Jan Kuschnek, Air Cosmos. Um, you didn't mention Airbus helicopters so far, 
Uh, how do you see the year 2020 for your subsidiary? Thank you. Um, thank you, Jan. I don't call them a subsidiary. <laughs> I call them a division or, or a business. You know, I have some sympathy for this business. Well, they've done a very nice and a very good uh, 2019, and I want to say it very clearly. It's a very strong performance from, from helicopters, especially having in mind the weakness of the market. So their, their support business is um, doing well. The defense side has been doing very well as well. And their market share on the civil and para public uh, is very strong, right, in a small market, but still a very strong market share because they have the right products. So uh, what, we, what we think uh, moving forward is that um, helicopters will continue to improve its, uh, its financial performance. They've done very well on many fronts, a bit, and cash as well, I have to say. Um, they have the right products. They will enter into service, certify and enter into service the H160, who has as well a lot of potential on the, on the defense side. Uh, what we see in, in, the, uh, in the service business, in my view, is a trend. So we have expectations that uh, the team at Helicopters uh, will continue to do well in 2020. Thank you, Guillaume. So we have time for three more questions. So the, the first one here, please. Good morning, Stefan Stahl from Augsburger Allgemeine. Can you tell us something about the future of premium aerotech? How many jobs will be cut? Thanks. Um, again, uh, in this environment, to be profitable, to be successful, to invest, uh, you need to have the right performance. Uh, we see the need for uh, restructuring in premium aerotech. We have started the discussions with our uh, social partners. That's why we have um, a charge of 103 million euros, I think, um, in 2019 to be able to run that uh, restructuring. Premium aerotech um, plays a major role in aviation, in commercial aviation in Europe, and obviously uh, mainly for Airbus. And I'm sure they will continue to play that role, but we want to give them the tools to be competitive against uh, outside competitors. This is very dynamic. There are new, uh, new technologies. There's more pressure coming from uh, low-cost countries. We see a future uh, Chinese uh, uh, player in, in aviation. So we need to be fully prepared, and that's, that's what we're looking at. We don't want to wait. Uh, for things to go bad. We anticipate, we prepare, we uh, give all the means to uh, Premium Aerotech to be competitive moving forward. That's the nature of what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning. My, my name is uh, Africa Semprum. I'm from uh, the newspaper El Economista. Uh, I, I, I would like to know if the company is studying or thinking about uh, bring uh, to the Spanish plant some commercial activity to, um, to compensate the reduction of the military activity in our country, in Spain. And, and, I will, and the second one is um, a few weeks ago, uh, Willie Walsh from IG said that the, the, the industry need more competition between in the, um, if I have the sentence here, let me read, that we need a strong competition between aircraft manufacturers. We only have two in really, and I think uh, we've, we've been seeing a situation where both Airbus and Boeing have become complacent. And I would like to know what you think about it. Thank you. Maybe I'll start with the last one. I, um, I hope we're not complacent. I think we are not. Uh, when I see the uh, cutthroat competition between uh, Boeing and Airbus, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite tough, it's quite amazing. And I think uh, all the airlines have benefited from this. The growth in the air traffic and the success of uh, civil aviation is a sign of this um, very healthy competition, in my view, between competitors. Well, we are bringing the 220 now to the table, so we're bringing a new product, and with the partnership we've had with Bombardier, and now with Quebec, and we're making sure that there is more competition and there are new products coming. Um, and um, I agree with Willy that the, the more competition, the, the better, and we're applying this as well to our own supply base. Um, Going to um, the situation um, in defense and space, well, this is a, a situation of the division uh, that is uh, across uh, uh, many countries. Um, 
um, the countries of Airbus, and we want to deal with that situation as we need to do. And uh, we are not playing uh, with pieces to try to offset one part by creating a problem somewhere else. We need to grow the business when it's time to grow, and we need to do the restructuring when we need to do it. And each part of the company has to take uh, its share in doing the right things moving forward. Thank you. So last question here. No, uh, this one here. Uh, Gerd, Hick Gerd Hickmann, newspaper Die Welt. Uh, I have a question to your outlook. You mentioned the deliveries you expect this year, but what's about your new orders you, you think you, you can get? What, what is your look in your crystal ball for this year? And the second one is about uh, defense and space. You mentioned restructuring, what, uh, re restructuring measurements, and how many millions, how many hundred millions you expect you can save with these measurements you you intend to do? Well, when it's about millions, I will let it to, <laughs> will let it to Dominic. I mean, your first question is indeed a very um, important question for us. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can give a bit of a color. Um, we are in a very unusual year, especially given the situation of our competitor, and things can go all directions in my view. So we ask ourselves the question, what would be okay? And I think the answer will be similar to the answer we had last year at the end. Uh, it's to continue to uh, gain contracts to maintain the very strong visibility we have today. It's quite of a privilege to have uh, 7,500 planes in the backlog. But I would be happy at the end of the year if we have a book to build close to one. Close to one. Okay. So on defense and space, um, cost reduction requirements, the way I would like to frame it is um, previously, we've seen a revenue run rate of about 11 billion in the business. Uh, we've seen order intake now for several years, more than 8.59 billion. So our question was, let's assume um, none of the white elephants would materialize as a stress test, so to speak. So we'd reduce revenues. And how much do we need to adjust the cost base to still achieve a high single digit operating margin, an EBIT adjusted margin. And that gives you indeed a significant cost reduction requirement and this is what we are currently working on. Okay, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap on our 2019 Airbus annual press conference. Um, thank you to our media colleagues who've invested time with us today, either here physically in Toulouse or on the web. Uh, Guillaume, Dominic, a big thanks to both of you. you. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, and maybe you have a few more minutes at the end for some questions as we, uh, as we leave. Um, and finally, uh, again, we're around. You're able to use the, the facilities till around 3 o'clock this afternoon. And um, a huge thanks from me to the communications team and the, and the organization team for the great preparation. Great job, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much.